The History of Sexuality, Volume 1, An Introduction, by Michel Foucault. Part 4. The Deployment of Sexuality. 2. Method. Hence the objective is to analyze a certain form of knowledge regarding sex, not in terms of repression or law, but in terms of power. But the word power is apt to lead to a number of misunderstandings, misunderstandings with respect to its nature, its form, and its unity. By power, I do not mean power as a group of institutions and mechanisms that ensure the subservience of the citizens of a given state. By power, I do not mean either a mode of subjugation, which, in contrast to violence, has the form of the rule. Finally, I do not have in mind a general system of domination exerted by one group over another, a system whose effects, through successive derivations, pervade the entire social body. The analysis made in terms of power must not assume that the sovereignty of the state, the form of the law, or the overall unity of a domination are given at the outset. Rather, these are only the terminal forms power takes. It seems to me that power must be understood in the first instance as the multiplicity of force relations imminent in the sphere in which they operate and which constitute their own organization, as the process which, through ceaseless struggles and confrontations, transforms, strengthens, or reverses them, as the support which these force relations find in one another, thus forming a chain or a system, or on the contrary, the disjunctions and contradictions which isolate them from one another, and lastly, as the strategies in which they take effect, whose general design or institutional crystallization is embodied in the state apparatus, in the formulation of the law, in the various social hegemonies. Power's condition of possibility, or in any case, the viewpoint which permits one to understand its exercise, even in its more peripheral effects, and which also makes it possible to use its mechanisms as a grid of intelligibility of the social order, must not be sought in the primary existence of a central point, in a unique source of sovereignty from which secondary and descendant forms would emanate. It is the moving substrate of force relations which, by virtue of their inequality, constantly engender states of power, but the latter are always local and unstable. The omnipresence of power not because it has the privilege of consolidating everything under its invincible unity, but because it is produced from one moment to the next, at every point, or rather in every relation from one point to another. Power is everywhere, not because it embraces everything, but because it comes from everywhere. And power, in so far as it is permanent, repetitious, inert and self-reproducing, is simply the overall effect that emerges from all these mobilities, the concatenation that rests on each of them and seeks in turn to arrest their movement. One needs to be nominalistic, no doubt. Power is not an institution and not a structure. Neither is it a certain strength we are endowed with. It is the name that one attributes to a complex strategical situation in a particular society. Should we turn the expression around, then, and say that politics is war pursued by other means? If we still wish to maintain a separation between war and politics, perhaps we should postulate rather that this multiplicity of force relations can be coded, in part but never totally, either in the form of war or in the form of politics. This would imply two different strategies, but the one always liable to switch into the other, for integrating these unbalanced, heterogeneous, unstable and tense force relations. Continuing this line of discussion, we can advance a certain number of propositions. Power is not something that is acquired, seized, or shared, something that one holds on to or allows to slip away. Power is exercised from innumerable points in the interplay of non-egalitarian and mobile relations. Relations of power are not in a position of exteriority with respect to other types of relationships, economic processes, knowledge relationships, sexual relations, but are imminent in the latter. They are the immediate effects of the divisions, inequalities, and disequilibriums which occur in the latter, and conversely, they are the internal conditions of these differentiations. Relations of power are not in superstructural positions, 
with merely a role or prohibition or accompaniment, they have a directly productive role wherever they come into play. Power comes from below. That is, there is no binary and all-encompassing opposition between rulers and ruled at the root of power relations, and serving as a general matrix, no such duality extending from the top down and reacting on more and more limited groups to the very depths of the social body. One must suppose, rather, that the manifold relationships of force that take shape and come into play in the machinery of production, in families, limited groups and institutions, are the basis for wide-ranging effects of cleavage that run through the social body as a whole. These, then, form a general line of force that traverses the local oppositions and links them together. To be sure, they also bring about redistributions, realignments, homogenizations, serial arrangements and convergences of the force relations. Major dominations are the hegemonic effects that are sustained by all these confrontations. Power relations are both intentional and non-subjective. If, in fact, they are intelligible, this is not because they are the effect of another instance that explains them, but rather because they are imbued through and through with calculation. There is no power that is exercised without a series of aims and objectives. But this does not mean that it results from the choice or decision of an individual subject. Let us not look for the headquarters that presides over its rationality, neither the caste which governs nor the groups which control the state apparatus, nor those who make the most important economic decisions direct the entire network of power that functions in a society and makes it function. The rationality of power is characterized by tactics that are often quite explicit at the restricted level where they are inscribed, the local cynicism of power, tactics which, becoming connected to one another, attracting and propagating one another, but finding their base of support and their condition elsewhere, end by forming comprehensive systems. The logic is perfectly clear, the aims decipherable, and yet it is often the case that no one is there to have invented them, and few who can be said to have formulated them. An implicit characteristic of the great anonymous, almost unspoken strategies which coordinate the loquacious tactics whose inventors or decision-makers are often without hypocrisy. Where there is power, there is resistance, and yet, or rather consequently, this resistance is never in a position of exteriority in relation to power. Should it be said that one is always inside power, there is no escaping it, there is no absolute outside where it is concerned, because one is subject to the law in any case, or that history being the ruse of reason, power is the ruse of history, always emerging the winner, this would be to misunderstand the strictly relational character of power relationships. Their existence depends on a multiplicity of points of resistance. These play the role of adversary, target, support or handle in power relations. These points of resistance are present everywhere in the power network. Hence, there is no single locus of great refusal, no soul of revolt, source of all rebellions or pure law of the revolutionary. Instead, there is a plurality of resistances, each of them a special case. Resistances that are possible, necessary, improbable. Others that are spontaneous, savage, solitary, concerted, rampant or violent. Still others that are quick to compromise, interested or sacrificial. By definition, they can only exist in the strategic field of power relations. But this does not mean that they are only a reaction or rebound, forming with respect to the basic domination and underside that is in the end always passive, doomed to perpetual defeat. Resistances do not derive from a few heterogeneous principles, but neither are they a lure or a promise that is of necessity betrayed. They are the odd term in relations of power. They are inscribed in the latter as an irreducible opposite. Hence, they too are distributed in irregular fashion. The points, knots, or focuses of resistance are spread over time and space at varying densities, at times mobilizing groups or individuals in a definitive way, inflaming certain points of the body, certain moments in life, certain types of behavior. Are there no great radical ruptures, massive binary divisions, then? Occasionally, yes, 
but more often one is dealing with mobile and transitory points of resistance, producing cleavages in a society that shift about, fracturing unities and affecting regroupings, furrowing across individuals themselves, cutting them up and remoulding them, marking off irreducible regions in them in their bodies and minds. Just as the network of power relations ends by forming a dense web that passes through apparatuses and institutions without being exactly localized in them, so too the swarm of points of resistance traverses social stratifications and individual unities. And it is doubtless the strategic codification of these points of resistance that makes a revolution possible, somewhat similar to the way in which the state relies on the institutional integration of power relationships. It is in this sphere of force relations that we must try to analyze the mechanisms of power. In this way, we will escape from the system of law and sovereign which has captivated political thought for such a long time. And if it is true that Machiavelli was among the few, and this no doubt was the scandal of his cynicism, who conceived the power of the prince in terms of forced relationships, perhaps we need to go one step further, to do without the persona of the prince, and decipher power mechanisms on the basis of a strategy that is imminent in forced relationships. To return to sex and the discourses of truth that have taken charge of it, the question that we must address then is not, given a specific state structure, how and why is it that power needs to establish a knowledge of sex? Neither is the question, what overall domination was served by the concern, evidenced since the 18th century, to produce true discourses on sex? Nor is it, what law presided over both the regularity of sexual behavior and the conformity of what was said about it? It is rather, in a specific type of discourse on sex, in a specific form of extortion of truth, appearing historically and in specific places, around the child's body, apropos of women's sex, in connection with practices restricting births, and so on, what were the most immediate, the most local power relations at work? How did they make possible these kinds of discourses, and conversely, how were these discourses used to support power relations? How was the action of these power relations modified by their very exercise, entailing a strengthening of some terms and a weakening of others, with effects of resistance and counter-investments, so that there has never existed one type of stable subjugation given once and for all? How were these power relations linked to one another according to the logic of a great strategy, which in retrospect takes on the aspect of a unitary and voluntarist politics of sex? In general terms, rather than referring all the infinitesimal violences that are exerted on sex, all the anxious gazes that are directed at it, and all the hiding places whose discovery is made into an impossible task, to the unique form of a great power, we must immerse the expanding production of discourses on sex in the field of multiple and mobile power relations which leads us to advance in a preliminary way four rules to follow but these are not intended as methodological imperatives at most they are cautionary prescriptions one rule of imminence one must not suppose that there exists a certain sphere of sexuality that would be the legitimate concern of a free and disinterested scientific inquiry were it not the subject of mechanisms of prohibition brought to bear by the economic or ideological requirements of power. If sexuality was constituted as an area of investigation, this was only because relations of power had established it as a possible object, and conversely, if power was able to take it as a target, this was because techniques of knowledge and procedures of discourse were capable of investing it. Between techniques of knowledge and strategies of power, there is no exteriority, even if they have specific roles and are linked together on the basis of their difference. We will start, therefore, from what might be called local centers of power knowledge. For example, the relations that obtain between penitents and confessors or the faithful and their directors of conscience. Here, guided by the theme of the flesh that must be mastered, different forms of discourse, self-examination, questionings, admissions, interpretations, interviews, were the vehicle of a kind of incessant back-and-forth movement of forms of subjugation and schemas of knowledge. 
Similarly, the body of the child, under surveillance, surrounded in his cradle, his bed, or his room by an entire watch crew of parents, nurses, servants, educators, and doctors, all attentive to the least manifestations of his sex, has constituted, particularly since the 18th century, another local centre of power knowledge. 2. Rules of Continual Variations we must not look for who has the power in the order of sexuality, men, adults, parents, doctors, and who is deprived of it, women, adolescents, children, patients, nor for who has the right to know and who is forced to remain ignorant. We must seek rather the pattern of the modifications which the relationships of force imply by the very nature of their process. The distributions of power and the appropriations of knowledge never represent only instantaneous slices taken from processes involving, for example, a cumulative reinforcement of the strongest factor, or a reversal of relationship, or again a simultaneous increase of two terms. Relations of power knowledge are not static forms of distribution, they are matrices of transformations. The 19th century grouping made up of the father, the mother, the educator, and the doctor around the child and his sex was subjected to constant modifications, continual shifts. One of the more spectacular results of the latter was a strange reversal. Whereas, to begin with, the child's sexuality had been problematized within the relationship established between doctor and parents, in the form of advice or recommendations to keep the child under observation or warnings of future dangers, Ultimately, it was in the relationship of the psychiatrist to the child that the sexuality of adults themselves was called into question. 3. Rule of Double Conditioning No local centre, no pattern of transformation, could function if, through a series of sequences, it did not eventually enter into an overall strategy. And inversely, no strategy could achieve comprehensive effects if it did not gain support from precise and tenuous relations serving not as its point of application or final outcome, but as its prop and anchor point. There is no discontinuity between them, as if one were dealing with two different levels, one microscopic and the other macroscopic, but neither is there homogeneity, as if the one were only the enlarged projection or the miniaturization of the other. Rather, one must conceive of the double conditioning of a strategy by specificity of possible tactics, and of tactics by the strategic envelope that makes them work. Thus, the father in the family is not the representative of the sovereign or the state, and the latter are not projections of the father on a different scale. The family does not duplicate society, just as society does not imitate the family. But the family organization, precisely to the extent that it was insular and heteromorphous with respect to the other power mechanisms, was used to support the great maneuvers employed for the Malthusian control of the birth rate, for the populationist incitements, for the medicalization of sex and the psychiatrization of its non-genital forms. 4. Rule of the Tactical Polyvalence of Discourses what is said about sex must not be analysed simply as the surface of projection of these power mechanisms. Indeed, it is in discourse that power and knowledge are joined together. And for this very reason, we must conceive discourse as a series of discontinuous segments whose tactical function is neither uniform nor stable. To be more precise, we must not imagine a world of discourse divided between accepted discourse and excluded discourse, or between the dominant discourse and the dominated one, but as a multiplicity of discursive elements that can come into play in various strategies. It is this distribution that we must reconstruct, with the things said and those concealed, the enunciations required and those forbidden, that it comprises, with the variance and different effects, according to who is speaking, his position of power, the institutional context in which he happens to be situated, that it implies and with the shifts and reutilizations of identical formulas for contrary objectives that it also includes. Discourses are not once and for all subservient to power or raised up against it, any more than silences are. We must make allowance for the complex and unstable process whereby discourse can be both an instrument and an effect of power 
but also a hindrance, a stumbling block, a point of resistance and a starting point for an opposing strategy. Discourse transmits and produces power. It reinforces it, but also undermines and exposes it, renders it fragile and makes it possible to thwart it. In like manner, silence and secrecy are a shelter for power, anchoring its prohibitions, but they also loosen its holds and provide for relatively obscure areas of tolerance. Consider, for example, the history of what was once the great sin against nature. The extreme discretion of the texts dealing with sodomy, that utterly confused category, and the nearly universal reticence in talking about it made possible a twofold operation. On the one hand, there was an extreme severity, punishment by fire was meted out well into the 18th century without there being any substantial protest expressed before the middle of the century, and on the other hand, a tolerance that must have been widespread, which one can deduce indirectly from the infrequency of judicial sentences, and which one glimpses more directly through certain statements concerning societies of men that were thought to exist in the army or in the courts. There is no question that the appearance in 19th century psychiatry, jurisprudence and literature of a whole series of discourses on the species and subspecies of homosexuality, inversion, pederasty and psychic hermaphrodism made possible a strong advance of social controls into this area of perversity. But it also made possible the formation of a reversed discourse. Homosexuality began to speak in its own behalf, to demand that its legitimacy or naturality be acknowledged, often in the same vocabulary, using the same categories by which it was medically disqualified. There is not, on the one side, a discourse of power, and opposite it, another discourse that runs counter to it. Discourses are tactical elements or blocks operating in the field of force relations. There can exist different and even contradictory discourses within the same strategy. They can, on the contrary, circulate without changing their form from one strategy to another opposing strategy. We must not expect the discourses on sex to tell us, above all, what strategy they derive from, or what moral divisions they accompany, or what ideology, dominant or dominated, they represent. Rather, we must question them on the two levels of their tactical productivity, what reciprocal effects of power and knowledge they ensure, and their strategical integration, what conjunction and what force relationship make their utilization necessary in a given episode of the various confrontations that occur. In short, it is a question of orienting ourselves to a conception of power which replaces the privilege of the law with the viewpoint of the objective, the privilege of prohibition with the viewpoint of tactical efficacy, the privilege of sovereignty with the analysis of a multiple and mobile field of force relations, wherein far-reaching but never completely stable effects of domination are produced. The strategical model, rather than the model based on law, and this not out of a speculative choice or theoretical preference, but because in fact it is one of the essential traits of Western societies that the forced relationships, which for a long time had found expression in war, in every form of warfare, gradually became invested in the order of political power.